Welcome. Thank you all for braving the Vegas night and for uh, coming to this session tonight. I'm Steve Kendricks. I am the Senior Technical Product Manager for AWS Batch. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Harshal Pimparkode. I'm a uh, Principal Product Manager for Amazon Lex. One of the reasons we have this session and we want to talk about it is AWS Batch um, is some, one of those interesting services that AWS uh, has built on top of other services that we build for customers to use, right? So Batch is a fully managed batch scheduler, and I'll get a little bit into more detail about what that means. But um, what we see that very often is customers who use our service aren't necessarily the customers that you think, right? So Batch relies on Amazon ECS, right? We run on top of ECS. We submit jobs to customers on ECS's behalf, which is the Elastic Container Service, if you're not familiar with that. But also, other services run on top of that, right? So we have this interesting um, and a philosophy at AWS, right? We build tools that customers are going to want to use. And what that means is that other people, including our own services, often use the very same tools that we build and we provide to customers, right? Because we really just want to build the best tools that are available, um, that we don't want to necessarily hide anything. We want to make special kind of APIs or special things under the hood where we can, right? We want to give customers the full access to resources that we have even built for ourselves, right? And so that's one of the interesting reasons we have this talk today is to discuss ECS, to discuss AWS Batch, but most importantly to discuss how um, Amazon and how AWS can build on top of the services that we fully provide to you and how we can build interesting things out of that, right? And of course, we're going to talk about Lex and how they, um, you know, also use some of our products to serve you, and how you can also use Lex to build um, your own cool things, right? So, let's talk a little bit broadly. Let's talk about machine learning, right? Because essentially, that's going to be one of the focuses here. If you're attended other batch sessions, this is probably going to be the deepest dive into how. Uh, customers are using us for machine learning. So let's talk about AWS as a whole. Why is AWS, why do customers choose AWS? Well, you know, one of the biggest reasons is there is, has the broadest and deepest platform choice, right? Bringing all, together all the capabilities of the AWS cloud, whether that's from compute, right? You know, 175, right? This is even an outdated slide, right? As of, you know, the end of this week, um, there's going to be more, there are more already, right? So talking about file systems, talking about managed services, talking about you know, all the capabilities, the networking configurations and, and capabilities that we have, right? We have an extremely broad and deep platform choice. What customers tell us very often, of course, this is the reason, very often the reason why we chose AWS, but one of the things that often customers tell us is I, I wish it were a little bit easier to tie it all together. I wish you know, there was somebody to be a little bit opinionated about the services that we are providing or the services that I'm choosing, right? Which of these instances should I be using for my workloads, right? And, that, and not to mention that, but how do I tie together, right? I have 10,000 training jobs to get through. How do I tie this together? Which of the services should I use in order to be, let me just focus on what I want to do, which is to build my model, train it, you know, run simulations against it, um, and deliver it to customers, right? How do I do that in a easily, a digestible way. Right, so that's why we built AWS Batch, right? To give customers access to kind of what we consider a cloud native scheduler. Right, so if you're familiar with other kind of on premise schedulers, Slurm, Torque, LSF, right, those are what we uh, those, are, those are schedulers that were built in an on premise world, right? They think about things in an on premise way. Um, right, they have a fixed cluster size. They know what the compute is in those clusters. They know exactly the capabilities. There's a, it's you know, fixed, essentially. It doesn't, generally speaking, doesn't change. Or if it does, there's configuration needed to be run in the scheduler to change it. What we did with AWS Batch was we said, well, customers need that kind of capability to do batch scheduling, right? which essentially, uh, at the end of the day, a lot of machine learning workloads look like a traditional batch job when you think about it. right? Customers need a way to do batch scheduling natively in the cloud, right? What are some concepts specific to the cloud? Things like uh, elasticity, right, for example. Things like if you're using the spot market, the AWS spot market, things like um, 
you know, right, I want to take advantage of the spot market. I'm going to get up, you know, 90% savings on my compute. Um, however, uh, sometimes, of course, that comes with interruptions. It comes with spot reclaims. I, I want to be able to do that. I need a scheduler. I need something that can help me think about that. And so that's something that we built into AWS Batch. So uh, the biggest things that Batch provides, fully managed, Batch provides a queue. It provides a compute environment. It provides uh, dependencies, retries, and manages those for you. Right? It provides job definitions. I'll explain how those work. Right? And it builds on top of ECS, right? so that kind of uh, capability to run Docker containers at scale in the cloud is extremely important, especially when you start talking about simulations for machine learning, when you start saying, I need lots and lots of compute very, very quickly, but I only want to pay for it when I'm actually using it. I don't want to keep running it all the time. Right, these are things that ECS lets us do, and that's why we built a scheduler on top of ECS. And then cost-optimized resource provisioning. What AWS Batch allows you to do is to think about your workload and the compute resources that your workload needs, and essentially say, I need, right, tell Batch, okay, I need this amount, right, these jobs need X number of vCPU and memory or the GPUs. They need the GPU, they don't, right, some jobs are uh, high compute, some jobs are high memory, some jobs need a lot of I.O., and think about their workload in those terms and only in those terms, right? There's no need to think about necessarily, you can if you want, there's no need to think about which instance type is necessarily best fit, how many of them do I need, Batch takes care of that for you. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how it does that and how you can leverage that to your advantage. Who uses AWS Batch? Well, of course, other AWS services, but in terms of external customers, right, autonomous vehicle and machine learning, right, we see very often, we see a lot of autonomous vehicle, but in machine learning in general workloads that are built directly on the top of the cloud because of the scale and the capabilities that it has. Gene sequencing, healthcare life sciences, uh, weather systems, modeling, financial risk analytics, um, image transformation, we see a lot of those workloads, right? Any typical batch workload where we say, okay, great, I need asynchronous compute. Um, generally speaking, my jobs can, you know, wait in a queue for a little bit in order to um, have uh, high concurrency but also low cost, right? That's the, the point and the value statement of what a batch scheduler brings. How do customers think, right? How do customers use AWS Batch. All right, we're going to get with Harsha will give you essentially how specifically Lex uses it for machine learning use case. But let's think about the typical Batch customer. And I'm going to be spending a lot of time on just on this slide discussing and showing how a customer can set this up. Right? So typically what we want people to think is I have this task. I have this workload. Right? Ahead of time, right, admin can go in. They can set up compute environment and they set up a job queue. They can set up, you know, there's obviously controls on each, and I'll get into a little bit more of how you can control these environments, but essentially what the compute environment is, is an, a place for batch to launch your instances, right, and allow you to have controls over which and how many instances batch will launch for you. Right, so very often what happens, is, and, then, and then also there's the job queue, which is essentially the place that you can assign users to, to um, you attach those to a compute environment, you can restrict um, or give customers access to certain queues um, depending on their priorities, depending on the importance of the workload. Um, you can give customers access to those things. Now what happens very often what we see is we have customers give output to an S3 bucket, right? So, or sorry, input to an S3 bucket. Right? You have the, maybe you have image transformation if you're doing, or doing some kind of extract, transform, and load operation you'll have jobs come into that S3 bucket. Maybe there's a Lambda function or some kind of an event that then triggers an AWS batch job. That batch job, right, as soon as that file hits the S3 bucket, you then uh, send a job to batch, and it can be a job of different characteristics. I'll get into how a job can be configured. Those jobs land in a job queue that's assigned to that user. The queue then once those jobs are in that queue, the scheduler will then evaluate the queue, and this is kind of where Batch, the managed, um, the managed queue and scheduling comes in, right? Batch then takes that queue, it evaluates kind of holistically, it takes a holistic picture of the queue and says, great, I know I have maybe 1,000 jobs in this queue, I know that these 1,000 jobs need X amount of vCPU, memory, and GPUs, right? So let's say we have 1,000 jobs that each take 
I don't know, two C vCPUs, right? So I know that I need 2,000 vCPUs worth of compute to put into your compute environment, so it goes ahead and launches those according to your specifications. You can also just say, hey, you know, that's just choose the optimal instance configuration for me. I don't even want to think about it. I don't want to give you a single instance ID. Batch will do that for you, right? So the important thing here is the queue is managed for you, right? You don't need to think about it. The scheduler, what actually takes those jobs, says, great, I need this much instance types, then places those jobs in a configuration which is best suited to your workload, right? So say I've got 1,000 jobs that need uh, a high amount of CPU, right? Batch will launch those high CPU, you know, essentially CPU uh, uh, memory ratio jobs, right? They will take those high CPU instances, they will place those jobs on those instances. Maybe I have 1,000 jobs that are necessarily high memory uh, jobs, right? You can, Batch will then take those high memory jobs and place them on uh, the instances, right, which are best suited for those workloads, right? So Batch does a good job of managing the, the life cycle of your instances, which type, which, uh, you know, which configuration you need, and places the jobs appropriately on the instances, right? And the idea here is cost savings, throughput, um, and essentially the ability to launch jobs at scale. Once the jobs are done, we see customers, right, the jobs are placed in the compute environment, they exit, the, the output gets written back to an S3 bucket and you have all the data you need, right? The logs get written back to CloudWatch. Now, the only thing that the end user has to think about in this entire thing, right, maybe, you know, your, your architect has already set up the job queue and compute environment configuration for them. All the user has to think is, what's my application image, right? What's my Docker image, right? And of course, we also need uh, appropriate roles to um, run, the, run the workload appropriately. One of the things that customer has told us is that very often AWS Batch, when it comes time to get into, right, I'm gonna launch instances for you, particularly in the spot market, we see that you know, customers often tell us, well, Batch does a great job at optimizing which instances it's launching for me. And so we did what was we launched uh, what we're calling allocation strategies for customers. What allocation strategies allow customers to do is essentially make cost and throughput trade-offs for instances, right? So what would happen is AWS Batch would very often use what we call in the middle there a best fit strategy. And what best fit means is essentially the least number of instances that are capable of running the jobs in your queue. But very often that meant that Batch would, would sit there and say, great, I know that this is the least cost instance, right? It can run, it's the most optimized, cost optimized uh, job for my workload. And then we very often just sit there and say, this is what the customer needs, right? This is the best fit for the customer. Um, but when we start talking about things like limited capacity in the spot market, we would very often see that customers uh, might not get all the throughput that they needed, right? They wouldn't get the amount of compute that they needed. So we launched two new strategies. One is best fit progressive. All that means is essentially we take the same best fit logic. We take, we take a look at the vCPU memory ratios. We launch, we take a holistic look at the queue and we launch the optimal mix of instances, right, that, that can run your jobs. But then also, right, progressively go through that list and say, great, if maybe C5.18XL is the best fit for my workload, but I will take C5.9XL if I can get it, assuming that it can launch the jobs, right? Batch is always gonna launch uh, instances that can run your jobs. I will take that if I can get it. Or maybe I need to switch instance families altogether in the spot market, very, sometimes that can happen, right, in, in uh, you know, very small allocation pools. You can need to switch instance families, so Batch will do that for you. We also support spots capacity optimized allocation strategy, and what that means is that Batch will, in the spot market, when you're using spot, it will automatically select the instances which have the deepest capacity pools. Right, and the, the benefit there is, of course, that your allocation is less likely to be interrupted. You're more likely to get instances that are deep in deep capacity pools, right? And even in the case, right, on the rare occasions, especially if you're launching large instance, um, large instances, right, a large amount of compute, you know, you can still obviously experience interruptions. So we will then switch in to new capacity pools as those come up, right? So we maintain that capacity for you throughout your workload lifecycle. 
now customers ask me, right, okay, how do we work these together, right? Let's imagine that I'm running a, an ETL job, an ETL workload. I need, I know that I need some low level of throughput that I, you know, pretty much need to be on demand. I need that to be, to be spun up quickly. I need it to run quickly. But the rest, right, and I know that it's about 100 vCPUs worth. So if you see up there on the right side of your screen, it's about 100, right? We restrict that top compute environment to 100 vCPU. Right, so what happens is the user will come in, they'll submit their jobs. Let's say they're submitting 1,000 jobs to the queue or 1,000 vCPUs worth of jobs to the queue. <clears throat> Customers will submit the job. It lands in the job queue to which they're assigned. Batch will then automatically start spinning up that first, that top compute environment. Right, they're using a best fit st progressive strategy right there, right? Because they know they want to get that capacity. I'd rather get that throughput. When we hit 100 vCPU, and then they're using optimal instances here, right? So letting batch kind of choose which instances it needs to run. When I hit that 100 vCPU, I'm automatically going to start going into the spot compute environment using the best, or excuse me, the spot capacity optimized strategy. Right, so what that means is, okay, I've got my level of throughput. The rest of it, I want to take advantage of cost savings in the spot market. Right, so we very often see customers using this strategy as, in order to take advantage both of batch, right, managing the ability to say, okay, great, I'm going to launch some, some low level of throughput on demand. The rest, I want to take advantage of cost savings. Right, and batch will manage making sure that that throughput can come in, right? Of course, not always, right? Spot sometimes can have limitations in the market, right? But essentially, Batch is going to do um, the best job it can at launching all the cap capacity it possibly can, right? All right, let's get a little bit more into how jobs can be configured. A job is essentially a piece of work, right? It is the actual piece. It is the actual container, right? And what that means is it's essentially something that Batch thinks about. It is a essentially a set of your Docker image, right? Your Docker image set and assigned, that piece gets assigned to a slot on an EC2 instance. A job definition is a template that Batch will manage for you. What a job definition lets you do is essentially say, I have this template of work right, that I know I need to get done. You can assign users to job definitions and say, I know what this needs to get, I know what needs to get done here, and say, I have essentially Right, these sets of parameters, right, if I want a specific retry strategy, I can have that retry strategy if I need a special specific mount points. Right? You also can specify vCPU memory and GPU requirements here. Right? And what the user will then do is then submit jobs according to that job definition template. So what you don't have to do is you don't have to resubmit over and over and over again the entire API or the entire um, code just to submit a job. Right? You can just reference this job definition. The benefit here is Batch will manage this for you, right? So you don't need to keep re-inputting it. You don't have to store it anywhere. Batch manages this for you. Job states, right? How does a job work, right? Similar to as if you have a, an on-premise scheduler, you might be familiar with some of these states, right? A submitted state just simply means, OK, great. You know, we've, we've accepted this job into the queue. It's landed in a Batch job queue. If it's pending, that means that you, you have specified a dependency on other jobs. We'll get into how batch manages dependencies in a second. Um, jobs are runnable, essentially, if batch has decided that it can run the job that is in the queue, right? A job is in the runnable state. It means that batch is either actively trying to place that job, or we need to spin up an instance to place that job in the queue. Now, starting, obviously, if, if that if that container has been assigned, right, an instance, right, the job then is starting, it's running, it's self-explanatory, it succeeded, right, and you can control what the success and failure criteria are. So if a job enters with an exit code of zero, then the job succeeds. If it exits with an exit code of not zero, then the job fails, right? So what does this do? Why am I telling you this? Well, well, very often what we see is we see customers building kind of workflow managers, right? And there's a big difference here between a workflow manager and a batch scheduler. We consider, you know, workflow managers best for things that need to run outside, maybe across services or across major steps or extreme, you know, differences in steps and workflows. So we see customers building workflow managers on top of AWS batch, right? Step functions is a good example, Airflow, um, others, and I'll get a little bit more into that, right? But what we see is right, the ability to combine those dependencies together and track job states means that then I can have a holistic view of my workflow. 
right? And essentially, you can express a dependency. Batch will maintain those dependencies. We also give you the ability to launch array jobs, right? If you need to launch 10,000 copies of a job very quickly, right? Why go in and hammer the API 10,000 times, right? Just submit one. You can then, right, and you don't need to, you know, programmatically handle it. Batch will handle it for you. Just pass us an index, and Batch will then split your jobs out in an array, right? This is really good for parametric sweeps, Monte Carlo simulations, and other kinds of large-scale parallel workloads, right? You can also express some pretty interesting dependency models here with array jobs. Again, familiar to you, with those of you who have familiarity with some on-premise schedulers, right? You can do an array job that depends on a single job, or a job that depends on an array job, or an array job that depends on a job. You can have an end-to-end -end dependency, right? So in here, you can see that job A0 starts and job A99 start, and they all start at the same time or close to it, right? We all try and start them simultaneously. Once job A0 finishes, job B0 finishes. And the good thing here is, of course, is that you don't need to wait for job 98 to finish before 99 finishes, right? So if job A99 finishes, or maybe, for example, job A2 is kind of your fault state where you know this one, or you don't know ahead of time, but essentially this one takes is going to take 10 more minutes to finish than, the, than job three, right? Job 99 will start and job B99 can start before you have to worry about job A2 starting, right? You can also express a self-dependency, right? So if you really want to say, I want job A10 to start only if job A0 succeeds, you can do that within batch. And you can combine all these together, right? So again, I remember I went back to talk about how um, batch kind of ties together these dependencies. So if I have job A, that's a startup job, or, and then I have three discrete steps that happen after that. Maybe I have a heavy network and IO step, I have a GPU intensive step, I have a memory intensive step, and then I have some cleanup works, you can do that. Well, the benefit here is that batch is only gonna run the jobs that are ready to run, and it's only gonna spin up instances that are ready to run, right? So for example, in this case, job A is gonna run. You can submit all of these jobs at the same time, right? Job A will run first. Right? And then Batch will say, okay, great, time to start job B. Right? And it's going to hold the other jobs impending. So what it means is that Batch will only launch the instances, for in this instance, the heavy network I.O. instances, until it's ready to run the GPU intensive instances. Right? And so that kind of benefit means that you can spin up and down instances. You only pay for when you need them, right? Favorite expression of the cloud. You, can only, you only have to pay for when, them when you need them. When we're done using them, we just shut it down. Right, we shut down the instances for you. Batch has a few ways to place jobs on containers. Right? So if I have an instance here, I can place a container here, I can place a job on there. Right? I can place one job to one container if you want. Right? Generally speaking, what Batch will do is it will try to place multiple containers on the same instance. Right? So gain that efficiency here of only right, not having to constantly spin up and down instances. Right? We will place those jobs on a single instance where we can to improve your efficiency and utilization. Right? We can also talk a little bit more about, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about how single node machine learning works on AWS Batch, but also right, we often see customers needing what we call multi-node parallel jobs. Right? Multi-node parallels is simply a way to spread that single job, that single piece of work over multiple hosts. Right? If you think about things like MPI applications or deep neural network training, this is a perfect example of that. Right? And so um, what that means is, is as I continue to add nodes to this cluster or to this compute environment here or to this job, right, I will continue to spread the work out. Now, very often what you see in these kind of distributed machine learning workloads or these MPI workloads is you need all of the instances up at the same time. Right? So if I know that I need 30 nodes, in my compute cluster, right? If I need, know I need 30 instances, Batch is gonna take a look at that. It will know that you need all 30, and it knows that you need them all at the same time, right? Why should I have to pay for 10 of the nodes in an MMP job when I'm not gonna be able to do anything with 10? I only wanna use, I, I need 30, I need all 30. So what Batch will do is essentially say, if you right, specify me that this is a multi-node parallel job, I know the node configurations that I need to launch, it will set those up for you, it'll set up the inter interconnect between the host, and it will give you all at the same time. 
This is also integrated with the <coughs> recently released uh, elastic fabric adapter, right? As you begin adding nodes to this kind of this system here, right? Latency begins to build up, of course, right? And what we did was we built essentially a low level latency interconnect, right? Network adapter for these sorts of workload, right? To reduce latency. And there's a lot of good talks online, a lot of good uh, material online about how that works, right? But Batch does this for you. Right, it'll also set up your file system, right? You specify a mount point, Batch will set that up for you. If you have a launch template ID, right, you want to pass specific uh, user data into your hosts, you can do that through AWS Batch, right? You just pass Batch the launch template ID, it will then spin up the instances according to that launch template, right? Here's an example of how DNN training um, runs on Batch. For, for example, you can often see here's your container repository. Right, or whatever you're using, right, you pass that to batch. We will then spin up, for example, this is a GPU workload. We spin those up if you want a placement group, right, specify a placement group, we'll spin those up for you in a placement group. We then obviously, right, we see customers using a high performance file system such as FSX for Lustre under the covers, right, to um, read and write back from S3 very rapidly. Right, and you see on the right there that nice linear scaling that happens, right? And that's an ideal, right? Because as you add hosts, you add GPUs, right? You then start building up latency, right? Where you want to see this nice linear graph here, which is what you see on the right. So that gets uh, pretty in depth into how AWS Batch works and how you can run machine learning workloads on Batch. Um, and right now we want to turn it over, we want to turn it over to right, my customer, but also right, a service that Amazon provides that utilizes a lot of these tools and techniques Right, to build their own machine learning workloads. Right. Hey, thank you, Steve. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, uh, today. Uh, in, in this uh, part of the discussion, I'm going to walk you through Amazon Lex. Uh, and uh, we want to talk about how Lex uses uh, AWS Batch for training and benchmarking purposes. So uh, before I jump in, just, just by a quick show of hands, uh, how many of you are familiar with, uh, with Lex? All right, some of you are. Uh, great. Uh, so uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, just want to provide, it, uh, provide some context before we jump into the details. Uh, Lex uh, is a service uh, that you can use to build uh, chatbots uh, or conversational interfaces uh, in voice as well as text. Uh, Lex has been uh, a publicly available service uh, for the past uh, two over two years, and uh, during this time, we've received a lot of customer demand uh, around uh, building chatbots and integrating them into uh, contact centers, into uh, build, integrating them into uh, websites and applications. Um, so, when we built Lex uh, at the time, uh, we looked at uh, what are the problems that we want to solve. And what we realized is for a, uh, for a developer, and there are several technologies um, that, uh, that need to be put together uh, to, to build a conversational interface. Uh, there are these uh, obvious technologies that you can think of, uh, speech recognition, of course, uh, and language understanding, uh, which require uh, the knowledge of uh, machine learning. But even beyond, beyond uh, these two uh, pieces, there are uh, several other uh, technologies that uh, you need to put together uh, to, uh, to stand up a service uh, for, for chatbots. Um, so for example, you need to have uh, several disparate systems talk to each other. Uh, all of these have to be um, uh, managed at scale. Uh, there has to be a sufficient testing that, that needs to go through, that, that the chatbot needs to go through. Uh, you, you need to be able to integrate with messaging platforms on one side, uh, for example, Facebook Messenger with Slack. Um, and on the other side, you have uh, the business logic uh, that, that, uh, that the bot needs to serve. So with, with this in mind, we uh, built Amazon Lex. And Lex is designed as an end-to-end -end service. Uh, so uh, in, a, in a single uh, API call, we have uh, several pieces that are stitched together for you. Uh, so you don't have to do the heavy lifting. Um, and uh, I'll walk you through uh, just a few uh, very quickly. 
uh, so consider a, a situation where you want to uh, you want to have a speech input and respond uh, back in speech. So the, the first piece uh, that that we uh, that we uh, uh, provide is a speech to intent capability, and uh, Lex provides an integrated speech recognition system. Uh, so uh, we convert speech to text, and then text is converted to an intent or mapped to an intent. Uh, th that's the speech to intent uh, piece. Uh, once, once you've recognized the intent, uh, the bot engages in a dialogue and uh, elicits information about uh, what is it that, that you want to perform as part of this intent. So that's the dialogue management piece. We uh, provide native support for, uh, uh, for dialogue management in, in Lex. Uh, once you have built a chatbot, you want to deploy it. Uh, I mentioned uh, a couple of platforms, uh, for example, Facebook uh, Messenger and Slack. Uh, Lex uh, natively integrates with Amazon Connect, uh, which is our contact center platform. And all of this needs to happen at scale. Uh, I uh, cannot... Uh, uh, emphasize it uh, enough. Uh, scale is important uh, for when it comes to chatbots. You are going to see uh, peak usage uh, uh, several times during the day itself, and, and you need to uh, accommodate this kind of scale. Uh, beyond this, you have business logic that needs to uh, that needs to be integrated. Uh, we provide a couple of options. We um, natively integrate with AWS Lambda. Um, also, you can uh, perform uh, client-side logic. Uh, finally, there's security. There's uh, analytics to, to ensure that there is uh, continuous learning uh, that's happening uh, through the chatbot. And finally, once all of this is done, um, you want to uh, be able to respond uh, back with speech. So that's the text-to-speech capability that uh, we provide through Amazon Poly. So that's, uh, that's Lex. And... Um, uh, in, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's, it's uh, an end-to-end. -end, we attempt to provide an end-to-end -end, uh, functionality over here. So, uh, taking taking a closer look uh, at Lex, I mentioned earlier, Lex uses the same uh, some of the same technologies as uh, Alexa. Uh, we have uh, the speech recognition uh, engine that that we use. Uh, this is the same that Alexa uses and the language understanding engine to uh, map uh, the user input uh, to, uh, to an intent. Um, so uh, this provides us with uh, robust algorithms uh, that, uh, are, uh, that are com continuously improving uh, over a period of time. Uh, some of the terminologies before we uh, get into the details of uh, how we use AWS Batch. Uh, so Lex uses... Uh, uh, like, like I mentioned earlier, voice as well as text, uh, and converts it into, uh, into an intent uh, that, that can be served uh, with a fulfillment through Lambda or otherwise. Uh, Lex has, uh, as, as we described them, intents. Uh, intents are nothing but uh, the goals that you want the user to accomplish. For example, if you want to uh, book a hotel, that's, that's an intent. If you want to book a car, that's a, that's a different intent. And uh, users can express these intents in many different ways. Uh, this is what we call uh, sample utterances. Uh, sample utterances is the training data that is provided to uh, the Lex chatbot, so it can learn from uh, these conversations. The second piece that, that uh, perhaps you should be aware of is utterances. Uh, these are uh, sample utterances, like I mentioned, uh, which, which uh, you provide. We typically recommend that uh, you provide uh, maybe 30 to 40 uh, sample utterances to provide a sufficient data set for Lex to learn. Uh, there are slots. Uh, slots are nothing but pieces of information that you elicit along the way as, as the conversation proceeds. So uh, in a, in a, uh, we'll see an example uh, in, in a bit. Uh, but uh, consider bo uh, booking a hotel. Uh, any information related to booking a hotel, uh, such as uh, the city that you want to stay in or the date that you want to check in and check out, uh, these are slots. 
and the dialog management piece uh, attempts to uh, elicit these slots and uh, fulfill the intent. And finally, the fulfillment. Fulfillment can happen uh, a couple of different ways, uh, either server side or client side. And um, if it's happening on the server side or service side, as, as, we, as we call it, that's through Lambda. And on the client side, uh, it's, it's uh, application of your choice. So uh, this is a quick um, overview of the different terminologies that we use uh, to, uh, uh, to set up a bot and a bot definition. Uh, next, let's take a quick look at uh, something like a uh, booking a hotel uh, in action. Uh, so let's, uh, let's say the user uh, comes in and it's a voice chat bot. The user says, uh, book a hotel in uh, New York City. Uh, the first thing that we do is convert uh, the speech to text and recognize that there are really five words over here, book a hotel in NYC. Uh, the next uh, piece that happens over here is we process that through our NLU engine and identify that uh, the user is looking for a hotel booking, which is the intent, and they have already provided a slot, which is New York City, or slot is the same as information uh, required to fulfill the intent. So once, once we uh, get this pieces of, um, these pieces of information, uh, we uh, uh, engage in a dialogue and perhaps uh, get additional information such as uh, the check-in date, the check-out date, and once we have received that information from, from the user, we go ahead and uh, confirm the intent. Uh, we call it a confirmation prompt. Uh, and, and the goal of uh, the confirmation is this is a high dollar uh, or a high value transaction running into hundreds of dollars uh, perhaps. And uh, you want to confirm it once before you go ahead with the hotel reservation. Once the confirmation is received, uh, we provide uh, the response back to Amazon Polly, uh, which is our text-to-speech uh, uh, service. And at that point, it is played back to the uh, user. Make sense uh, so far? OK. All right. So now let's take a look at uh, AWS Batch and how Lex uh, specifically uses um, Batch. So uh, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, Lex uh, continuously improves uh, behind the scenes. Uh, we are continuously enhancing our algorithms, whether it's speech recognition or language understanding, and, and the benefits uh, are provided back to you uh, in a seamless way. Um, AWS uh, Amazon Lex is a managed service, and you um, benefit from these uh, improvements and from these continuous improvements uh, seamlessly. So to reach this state, we have to uh, train uh, the models, and then we have to benchmark these models uh, to ensure that we have made improvements across the board, or mostly across the board, so that uh, every, every revision of our um, of our uh, engine, whether it's, is, whether it's a speech recognition engine or the language understanding engine, provides net benefits to our customers. So on the, on the left side over here, we have uh, the developers and uh, the data scientists. Uh, these are the two community, communities that uh, participate in the, bench, in the training and the benchmarking. Uh, typically, the developers build the tools and uh, share it with the data scientists, and the data scientists then consume uh, or operate these tools on the data that they have uh, to uh, create the models. That's, that's the general workflow. Uh, now, these tools are provided as Docker images. Uh, each tool uh, can be uh, packaged inside of a Docker image, and uh, that's, that's eventually uh, used for, for training. Uh, first, we'll go through the training piece, and then we'll talk about benchmarking. Uh, when it comes to training, uh, we have a uh, Elastic Container Registry, or ECR, uh, that holds uh, the Docker image. And uh, it's pulled off of the ECR uh, every time a job needs to be run. We use spot fleets uh, to, uh, to manage uh, these, uh, the, the compute requirements, uh, mainly for cost optimization uh, reasons. But the interesting part over here is the use of uh, Elastic File System, or e EFS. Uh, we uh, mount 
the EFS and it's shared across all the instances in the spot fleet. And what this does is it reduces uh, the time it takes to load a Docker image and uh, thereby it speeds up the process. Uh, so that's, that's one uh, critical piece that uh, I, I would highlight over here. Uh, eventually, uh, as, a, as a result of, of this uh, decrease in, in latency, uh, we have seen uh, benefits of up to, up to uh, uh, a magnitude of order of uh, benefits. Uh, so we cut down from, let's say, from days to hours when it comes to the training time. Uh, another piece that uh, I'd like to call out is uh, the use of uh, S3 buckets. So when we uh, train uh, these models and we want to store uh, the data back, uh, this is stored in, in S3. And this is mostly for analytics uh, purposes uh, to uh, ensure uh, that uh, other teams within, uh, within the organization can, um, can use the trained models. When it comes to benchmarking, it's uh, something similar, uh, except uh, with benchmarking, uh, we have a uh, continuous um, storage uh, to S3 uh, as compared to, uh, compared to training. So that's, uh, that's the overall uh, architecture when it comes to training and benchmarking. Uh, with this, I'll uh, turn it back uh, to Steve uh, to uh, take it forward. Thank you. All right, great. So uh, hopefully you have learned a little bit about how machine learning can get um, up and started on AWS, just in general. Obviously, AWS Batch um, is a good tool to use towards that end. Um, Harshal and I are going to stay up on stage if we have any questions. But overall, thank you for coming. Thank you for braving us. Uh, thank you for uh, coming uh, overall. Appreciate it. Any questions from the audience? Uh, can't tell. Is that a, is that an all the way hand? Is that a partial hand? Yeah, go ahead. Two hands. Yes, uh, perfect. Um, so performance is good, but uh, how soon does the uh, batch job kick off? Like, you set it up and say, hey, you know, go. Yeah. Um, so not exactly uh, clear because again, uh, the latest slides actually talk about the uh, batch processing, but the batch power actually happens. In Right. So it has nothing to do with that. That essentially gives the background of all that. So the question is, how soon can I turn around and say, okay, you know, where do I after my training? Where how do I plug in my model? Um, I'm not sure I quite understand quite the understand question. It. So it's what's the turnaround time? Because your strategy, for example, if you are not the uh, best fit strategy, as you're thinking, okay, what's yep. the Mm -hmm. then if the model runs too long or if I could not find any resources to fulfill the yeah. training or finish the training in time, then I'm kind of waiting for that training session to be over. Sure, so I see, so, so let me see if I've got a, Right, so let's say let's let's take it out of like the the aspect of training here. Let's talk more just about the job itself, right? So I've got you know maybe I don't know 15 jobs, right? And they're all running. One of them, you know, maybe I have some jobs that are dependent on other jobs to finish, right, before they can run. Here, for example, maybe something similar to this setup here. Um, and what happens if uh, maybe one of these jobs gets kind of you know goes too long? It, it gets kind of stuck, right? Do I have to sit there and wait? So there's a few things that you have to manage, right? If you have a hard dependency on something, right, of course, Batch is not going to start that job unless the, the dependent job or the, the job it's dependent on is complete. But you can have controls um, within Batch that will manage for you. Um, for example, right, we'll have a timeout. We have a timeout mechanism. So if you say, I, only, I know this workload should run for 10 minutes, right, if it runs for 12 minutes, then just kill the job, right? The, the point there is that, of course, right, of course, the dependent jobs aren't going to be able to work. But what will happen is right, that, that main job will fail. And of course, right, and you'll know that it failed. Right, we'll admit an event that that job has failed. And you can go in and do whatever actions you need to do to get it, your workload back up and running. Does that, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah. OK, perfect. OK, so about benchmarking um, too. Like, we talked about training. So how is it used for uh, benchmarking? 
Do you want to handle that? Uh, you go first. Um, you mean in terms of specific to Amazon Lex? Sure. Yeah, so uh, with benchmarking, we uh, uh, take the models, uh, candidate models, and we run them against uh, data. But typically, we split uh, the data into 80%, 20%. So 80% is used for training, and 20% is kept for uh, a benchmarking data set. This is uh, what we call the blind data set, uh, so that that's not, that's not seen by uh, our, our sci data scientists or by anyone else, really. And uh, with, with the same uh, fleet, uh, we perform the benchmarking. We have uh, several different uh, metrics that we uh, track. Uh, for example, um, the intent classification score, uh, the slot, slot resolution uh, accuracy, um, as well as the F1 score. And, and those are the metrics that we used to compare, uh, let's say, two or four candidate models. Okay, so yeah. that's, that's just typical of machine learning techniques? Yes. Yeah, you might see this very often when we see customers. Something similar to this might be, you know, simulation. If you're running simulation, simulation then resim, right, would be, would be another way to do kind of something similar to here. Yeah. No, I thought, I thought Batch offers something different, but that's okay. Yep. Yeah, Batch doesn't, so, so just speaking, right, Batch is a, is a batch scheduler by trade, right? You know, you can choose to do machine learning. You can choose to do ETL, right? We aren't a purpose-built kind of a machine learning tool, right? Something like a SageMaker might be if you're looking for kind of a managed, fully managed SageMaker or machine learning um, tool. But of course, there are capabilities that Batch has that kind of add on top and make, you know, maybe machine learning training at scale, right? At, at a very large scale or some sort of special customizations here, right? That's where we start seeing the value added of a more traditional Batch scheduler. All right, yes. Is that, what was the last thing? We, do we have a plan to use? Sorry, I'm not sure. Why are we using ECS versus EC2 or Fargate or something like that? Um, so one of the big things we built we built on top of ECS when we launched. Um, Right, and that was what was you know kind of available at the time in terms of in terms of ECS in particular, um, in terms of in terms of container orchestrators. Let me rephrase. Right, we really felt that uh, batch scheduling is something that containers kind of comes naturally to in terms of right. I have a discrete piece of work, and why should I need to right? And and, and the compute layer that's underneath that is kind of. Um, I don't want to say necessarily irrelevant, but kind of a different matter altogether than necessarily the, the piece of work that I want to get done. Right? One of the benefits of containers, of course, is that right, it makes that isolation a lot easier. So if I just need to, right, as, you know, assuming within the same user, the same, same workforce, I can just easily and seamlessly reuse that compute resource underneath multiple times. Um, that is definitely something that you can do very, pretty easily with containers. Right? That's the reason we chose batch or ECS, right? And of course, ECS itself has, um, you know, the best in terms of integration with other AWS services. It has scale, right? It scales massively. ECS can scale very, very high, right? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of vCPUs if necessary. It can also um, scale back to zero extremely quickly, right? And that is obviously important. Now, right, in terms of Fargate, um, in terms of other sorts of compute resources, um, these are things that we are looking at, um, you know, at some time in the future um, to integrate with, um, and because we do see customers that are looking, right, right, batch manages the instances for you. Um, we will install an, an AMI, we will, you know, launch the instance, we will take down the instance once it's ready, but some customers even say, I don't even want to see the instance, right? And so that's something we're thinking very carefully about. Did that answer your question? Perfect. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, currently, yes, we support U.S. English, uh, and uh, we have plans to expand uh, into other languages. Uh, we we have a pretty robust roadmap going into the next year and, and after that. 
uh, for several languages. I can I can uh, meet with you uh, after the session. Yes. So uh, we use the same uh, publicly available APIs, the post content and post text, to integrate with uh, Connect. Uh, Connect is a contact center software, so it uses a telephony network. Uh, so the models are uh, the models that we use are eight kilohertz, uh, which is which is just uh, uh, used used in the in the telephony environment, uh, but uh, from from a end user perspective you can use the same capability uh, directly from uh, APIs. So if you wanted to call the 8 kilohertz models using post content, you could uh, do that. Because I saw analysis, they have other things like, I went to the session this morning, they have this new thing called analysis composition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so we, uh, uh, we use uh, the same uh, speech recognition and, and language understanding as Alexa. Uh, so the, that's a 16 kilohertz flavor, and uh, the same is available. Uh, perhaps what you're referring to is the features, and uh, the features, uh, we plan to launch the same features on Lex. It's just that you might see some um, uh, lag. Uh, that's because we uh, test those features out on, on our stack, uh, before we launch it to our customers. Yeah. Okay, question here. Another question. Um, so do you have uh, scheduling kind of capability to match or? You scheduling? mean in terms of time, like actual yeah. hard time, wall time scheduling? Yeah, yeah sure. So, um, right, so essentially Batch has integration with CloudWatch events. Um, right, it's a very easy way for the same reason for how customers might when a file gets input into an S3 bucket, right, let's trigger a batch job. Same thing when it is X time on the wall, trigger this batch job, right? So and you, can, and you can just trigger that directly from CloudWatch, does so, that make sense? Yeah, so not entirely. Um, so when, if I had ETL jobs, for example, yeah. every Monday, yep. or you know, 12 o'clock at night every Monday, some kind of things. So it's repeating, right? Yep. So, But you can also, we have, we have many, very, very many customers doing this exactly the way I just described, okay. essentially. And so for the audience, the question was essentially, right, can I run a job weekly? Right, can I run my weekly ETL job or my nightly ETL job? Um, right, and you can do that um, pretty easily through, through, that, through that method. Yep. Yes. Is there any limitation on the EFS mount size? On, is there any limitation on the EFS mount size? Uh, you, any limitation, so batch, all, all you're sending to batch is essentially where's the mount point where my jobs need to go. So any, so batch itself doesn't have any limitations on, um, you, you know, anything in particular beyond what EFS already offers, if that makes sense, right? So we don't, we don't necessarily, you know, I, I don't want to say care isn't the, isn't the right word, but essentially we don't restrict you on, uh, you know, any of your mount sizes other than, than what you might see already in EFS. Did that answer your question? Uh, yes, but uh, yeah. well, why was it implemented? I a similar architecture in my company as uh, that's the system that we are running right now. And uh, we saw an error one day while doing the training regarding the limits of space that uh, we Yeah, so uh, was it something like read and write or something like that? Okay, so the question kind of for the audience was, you know, I saw a limitation, right? I got an error when I was trying to use batch or, or maybe something similar uh, or a similar kind of scheduler, um, right? Is there any limitation here? So that is essentially very often what we see customers encounter when using not just AWS batch, but, a, you know, any sort of thing at scale is, right, read and writes back and to from EFS um, or other sorts of limits, right? For those sorts of things, just um, for those sorts of limits, just contact the account team. Um, they should be able to help you out in terms of um, that. But those in particular are not, uh, you know, restrict, you know, batch doesn't get you essentially raise limits in any necessary um, uh, form. We do have kind of things that we do on the back end to make scale e easier. 
um, but we don't necessarily, we aren't able to, to raise those limits for you. And the idea here is to protect you from fraud in some cases, right? So um, we don't want to necessarily let somebody go in and launch a bunch of resources and batch, um, you know, where you're not expecting, right? So um, yeah, again, if, you, or if you're hitting, uh, uh, whether it be, we don't have in necessarily instance limits anymore, but we're hitting the CPU limits in EC2, um, we're hitting spot limits, right? Again, these are things that you can request to be raised. Um, just the same with any service. Yes? What kind of triggers can you trigger when a batch? Well, so again, we go back to, right, so every batch job, right, is going to submit a log. It's going to have a log in CloudWatch and it. it's going to give an event in CloudWatch. So essentially, right, that's the scale where we're talking, right? So if you, we also have native integration. Again, I go, go back to workflow managers, which is a very popular thing to, in, in, you know, to build, right, if I have, if I'm using different services, if I'm running, you know, if I'm trying to hook in different services together, um, if I want to run a certain job in Lambda and a certain job in Batch, right, we see workflow managers, so Batch has uh, integration with step functions, for example, right, so also you can submit a job through step functions, and step functions will essentially read that response and say, okay, great, this job is done, let's trigger something else. And any sort of other workflow manager in general, right, we have integration with Airflow, we have integration with Luigi, um, and other, uh, for example, uh, Lyft's flight open source machine learning um, workflow right, is, is in part um, you know, integrated with Batch, um, and then other workflow managers, right? So those are generally what we see customers doing, right? Of course, but of course, CloudWatch events, uh, CloudWatch logs. Any last questions? Just have that over here first. I have one question for Dex. Yes. Mm -hmm. I wonder, uh, since, since you leave it as a drop, I wonder why you have, when you're not using Sages, and why you have chosen Batch for training your big data network. Yes. Uh, so uh, for, for us, uh, the scheduling is important. Uh, also, a Batch allows us to uh, integrate with EFS. Uh, and use the EFS mount, so that's that's another piece. Like like I mentioned earlier, it reduces uh, our load times for the Docker images uh, by magnitude of order. Uh, so we see a lot of benefits there. Uh, with um, uh, conversational uh, AI in general, uh, there's tons of data that needs to be processed, and uh, mm -hmm. this architecture provides us uh, with uh, the the ability to quickly. Uh, turn around and f identify models for benchmarking st uh, stage. So th those are some of the some of the uh, uh, factors uh, which uh, uh, which we considered as we selected batch. Load more data in yes. All right. That's pretty much time. Thank you again for all for coming. Please don't forget to fill out the survey and uh, mobile app, and uh, we'll be available to talk afterwards if anybody would like to discuss. Thanks. All right. Thank you.